all philosophies, all viewpoints, all political inclinations, aesthetic choices are categorically underpinned by a metaphysical commitment that is adhered to whether consciously or not. The school of Ibn al-Arabi, which will be addressed this evening by Sheikh Hassan Spiker, combines more intimately perhaps than any other system two very distinct elements. On the one hand, an intellectual structure of an acute intelligibility imbued with a subtle and rigorous analysis. And on the other, a refreshing precipitateness which masters every detail in a profound cohesion that transports the soul well beyond the dry and desiccated regions of dialectic. Its survival and continuity, and every system of thought invariably shares in the permanence it radiates, is manifestly due to the element of truth it conveys and allows one to experience, as well as its notable characteristics of permanence and perpetual renewal. Every statement of its proponents, one could say, implies the whole body of the doctrine that is espoused. For such metaphysicians, philosophy is a revealed science going back to the prophet Idris alayhi salam, often identified with the figure of Hermes or even the prophet Enoch. The point being that speculative thought is above all a prophetic knowledge, which the philosophers subsequently inherited, going astray when that knowledge becomes corrupted. Prophetic knowledge in the form of revelation is thus the source of all true philosophical endeavor. We find correlations of this view in Justin Martyr's first apology, where he follows the dogmas of the Timaeus, but not necessarily Plato's arguments or rationale for those dogmas. When discussing the notion of shapeless matter, he offers us the view that Plato's ideas were in essence plagiarized from Moses. Moreover, Philosophy is justified by him on the basis that the philosophers had originally learnt their wisdom from the prophets. The teachings of Christianity were not considered to be alien to Plato's thought, but then neither were they considered wholly similar. And that is the point. When it comes to metaphysics, more so than philosophy, one can say that there are oases of convergences, correspondences, correlations, and even parallels in the structure of some ideas but the meaning content may often be very different. What do we then mean by metaphysics? And if not neutral, does its particularity diminish its objectivity? The metaphysics I would like to address is what can be termed pure metaphysics, a metaphysics that transcends ontology, beginning with the principle that stands above being, which is, is its first determination or ta'ayyun. The divine reality cannot be exhausted by being. God is absolute existence, but then absolute existence is not God. Being cannot be the absolute, since being is determined by the absolute. The conflation of metaphysics with ontology here is inadmissible, as metaphysics is logically anterior, so to speak, to ontology. This also allows us to understand how creation cannot exhaust possibilities, what can be termed pure possibilities that remain in the divine knowledge. And we won't go into that tonight, obviously. This understanding furthermore is alluded to, one could say, in the Christian tradition where the divine essence is not held to be a person, but the persons are what they are by way of it. This notion of beyond being, for want of a better term, is what Jakob Burme terms Ungrund or Dennis, most luminous darkness, or even Eckhart, Gottheit. That is to say, beyond the distinction of being and non-being. Here, one can behold the correspondence. The Neotomist school of the early 20th century invariably held that metaphysics arose from the domain of natural theology rather than revelation. This is somewhat problematic for Muslims in that any conceptual apparatus used within metaphysics must necessarily be transcended for any realization of the metaphysical realities to take place. To access this, a form of intellectual intuition is required, which can only be accessed by way of spiritual progression, which in turn can only be learned from revelation. The basis and fount of Islamic metaphysics inextricably rises from the Quran, 
the undertaking of the spiritual journey to God by a Muslim is operative as a spiritual method because it precisely arises from the body of revelation. Furthermore, the highest language of metaphysics here is the language of symbols as a meta-language, not of dialectical discourse, since logic premised on duality is incapable of fathoming, we aver, principal realities. In the Futuhat al makiya a book by Ibn al-Arabi, in chapter 363, he states that the unity al ahadiyya of the One is not the essence, the Ain, of whom such unity is attributed. Such a unity is conceived by the created intellect, whereas the divine ipseity and its essential reality, haqiqa, cannot be conceived by it. This is because God's unity is his theophany, tajalli, to himself. A theophany defined by Ibn al-Arabi as ma yankashifu lil qulubi min anwar al ghuyubi ba'd as-sat, that of the lights of the divine mysteries which is disclosed to the hearts following their concealment. One can also say in this domain that abstract concepts themselves are also symbols, since language itself is symbolically operative and allows the aspirant to arrive at some understanding, at some form of language of of, to describe reality that can reflect its inherent intelligibility. In chapter 86 of Kitab al-Mawaqif, uh, written by the 19th century Emir Abdul Qadir al-Jazairi, it is stated that the hierarchical degrees, maratib, and descents, tanazulat, are nothing but symbolic expressions, umur atibariya, that have no existence except in the symbolic transposition of the one who uses them. An example of this is found in the transmission of spiritual realities in poetry, which abounds in the literature of Sufism. When Ibn al-Arabi writes, the white pearl descended upon the red ruby, he's referring to the first intellect, the first determination, descending upon the universal soul or the guarded tablet, which is also the receptacle of the pen. The color of the tablet is green, hence the preponderance of green as a color of choice. The tablet is the place of descent of all the celestial books. And it is itself the first book in which the universe was inscribed. The act of writing is sacralized by this reality. And hence the flavor of this enters even the craft of calligraphy where the simple act of writing becomes a sacramental act. This is metaphysics by the higher road. The Emir Abdul Qadir continues elsewhere to give the parable of a great king whom no one has seen before and whose qualities are unknown and who wishes to make himself known. This is another illustration of metaphysical discourse that one finds in the meta language of allegory and symbol. The king in the tale realizes that it is impossible for him to reveal his essence, but that he could let himself be known by way of his attributes and qualities. He therefore goes out, veiled by whatsoever characteristics and traits, and declares, this form that you perceive is a symbol of my true form, because I know you are incapable of grasping my reality and essence. I thus reveal to you this form so that you might know me in part in a manner that is appropriate for you and not as I truly am, as that, it is, as that is impossible. Choose then from this form the form you desire. If we look at this parable, the form that the king veils himself in is the first determination, which is the haqiq al muhammadiyya the Muhammadan reality, which is the first intellect, also the pen, al-qalam. This reality is also absolute non-manifestation. According to the Amir, the first form of the king is the source, the archetype, 
and principle of all forms. It is also that by which all things are manifested. One other name for this Muhammadan reality is the mirror of the universe, Mir'at al qawm As the universe is manifested in it, but as a mirror is hidden by that which is reflected in it, so is the Muhammadan reality veiled by manifestation of the forms in it. The descent of manifestation through the degrees of being requires though a corresponding ascent from phenomenal multiplicity back to the real. This is what revelation enables. The passage from one degree of existence to another is governed by God's desire to be known through the manifestation, what we call mazhar, of creation. As the Quran states, سَنُورِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ Chapter 41, verse 53, we will show them our signs upon the horizons and within themselves till it becomes clear to them that he is the real. This verse and many like it give rise to a correspondence between metaphysical truth and cosmological realities. The science of cosmology, ilm al-afaq wal-anfus, is essentially metaphysics writ large the world as a locus for the theophany of God's names. One thus finds a recurring coincidence between functionality and symbolism. When we examine the human being, the Emir Abdul Qadir says, we see that the human face is that by which we orient ourselves towards something. God in his unfathomable wisdom and immense mercy made it into a mirror wherein are manifested the states of the heart, which otherwise cannot be elicited. In this scheme, the fully realized human being, al-insan al-kamil, reflects the face of the real, al-haq. This brings to mind the Sahih al-Hadith in Bukhari, where the Prophet states, he who has seen me has seen the real. Man ra'ani faqad ra'a al-haq. This theophonic mirroring is everywhere. When the sculptor or stonemason grasps his tools, he is taught to hold the mallet firmly and the chisel loosely in the other hand. The chisel is to remain passive so that the strike of the mallet can guide it to the intended result. The guild masters taught the apprentice that this central act of the craft is a recapitulation of the first intellect imprinting upon the universal soul. From the perspective of the mallet, the chisel is passive. From the perspective of the stone, the chisel is active. We find here that the higher reality of the first intellect imprinting the universal soul has a symbolic resonance in the craft of stone carving, but also that this symbolism has functional validity in that there is no other effective way to handle those tools except in the manner described. A true symbol thus is functional at all levels of reality, so that there is a direct relationship and effect between cosmological truth and the domain of the crafts, which necessarily gives rise to a correspondence between metaphysical truth and artistic forms, which in a traditional Islamic context are also and necessarily imbued with symbolic resonances of metaphysical reality. Such prevalence allows one to appreciate the fact that metaphysics has a visual complementarity, namely, it is not only intellectually known, but also seen and mirrored in our acts. To go back to our earlier question of whether there might be a shared metaphysics, I think both Christians and Muslims can agree on shared metaphysical principles and hierarchies. And we will hear about that today. There is a word of caution though, as the relationship with metaphysical truth, as was stated, is not an intellectual one alone, but rather a cosmographical guide mediated for the Muslim by the prophet for our journey to God. We do not, consequently separate our metaphysics, as some universalists have falsely attempted to do, from the specific task of spiritual realization as channeled by the Islamic revelations. 
the role of the prophet thus is all. In terms of cosmology, as well and better known to you all, Plato's Timaeus, as mediated by such figures as Chalcidius, introduced into the medieval world what can be termed microcosmicism by way of his commentary on that text. Chalcidius saw the city as a small world, an ordered microcosm of the universe, but also a macrocosm of the human being. This was later developed by Alain de Lille uh, uh, in the late 12th century in his De Plank to Naturae, The Complaint of Nature, where the concept of the city becomes both cosmos and body with the same moral topography as the, human, as the universe the highest orders being at the center and the lowest at the edge as the human body. This idea of the urban space as mirroring of macrocosm and microcosm imbued medieval ideas of space with symbolic resonance. It also directed the manner in which Christian medieval cities were constructed, ordered and inhabited. This inevitably led to the development of a social philosophy that I believe culminated in an ideal that was almost entirely shared by Muslims, at least in its central ideas. This social philosophy is metaphysically posited and cosmologically cognizant of the influence of the higher orders of creation, the well-ordered craft societies, the principle of subsidiarity, the abhorrence of mechanism, the championing of the tool, the necessity of art, sonoral and plastic for the manifestation of knowledge that could not otherwise be accessed and thus metaphysically rooted. Here is a shared understanding between Islam and Christianity that should be explored further as societies disintegrate further around us. If the basis and the fount of Islamic metaphysics is the Quran, as was mentioned earlier, this did not imply that the language sometimes used to expose this metaphysics made use of the lexical apparatuses of already existing philosophical systems. In the case of Ibn Arabi himself, his language is, in, is inextricably linked to the language of the Quran and the Hadith collections. This can also be gleaned from his holding that the science of Hadith is the highest and most preeminent of sciences. This does not then imply that the metaphysics shared any continuity with those systems from whom it may borrow its terms. In the case of Neoplatonism, there are many conjunctions with the school of Ibn Arabi, as where Platonic truths coincided with the realities as they truly are. These are a case where truth coincides, a vertical coincidence, one could say, and not necessarily horizontal. People do not abandon their principles easily. In an age of globalized finance where capital flight can be achieved in seconds, environments can be destabilized to overturn social norms at will and thus destroy centuries of civic ecosystems. That which allows continued regeneration in the face of such utter destruction is a metaphysics which situates its adherent at the center once more, allowing the choreography of ordering to take place over and over again. The loss of identity, an organic and essential reality and not merely a label, that we perceive around us today, displacing traditional norms and balances, is due prim primarily to the loss of that which permits identity to develop, namely, a metaphysically rooted and ordered society. This, I suggest, must remain our primary, and if not our primary, then preeminently, our shared responsibility as fellow faith adherents. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Karim, uh, for this wonderful speech. And uh, definitely, um, now uh, let's go to the second uh, talk which is by um, Hassan Spiker, um, which is about the fellowship in the degrees of being, the deduction of cosmic order, and the possibility of shared metaphysics. So, Sidi Hassan, Bismillah. Mm -hmm.
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. There is nothing of which it is not possible to achieve knowledge by means of unveiling and experience. Being occupied with speculative thought is a veil. Some others deem unveiling and experience impossible, though no one amongst the people of the way of God. Those who deem it impossible are the people of speculative investigation and deduction amongst the scholars of outward appearances who have not tasted spiritual states. If some of them have, have tasted spiritual states like the divine Plato, Aflatun al-Ilahi, amongst the philosophers, this is rare amongst them. You will find that he is of the same disposition as the people of mystical unveiling in existence. Those amongst the people of Islam who have disliked him have only done so because of his ascription to philosophy due to their ignorance of the signification of this word. And he then goes into the etymology of the term. Mahidin ibn Arabi al-Futahat al makiyah chapter 226. Now this is, I think, an extraordinary um, uh, correspondence here, which I'm very grateful to my friend Muhammad Sami for pointing out to me very recently, um, that uh, Sayyid al-Sharif al-Jurjani is one of the most famous Kalam theologians uh, of really the last 600 years. He, he lived uh, until about, I think he died in 1414. Um, and he's associated with, you know, very, uh, well, very standard, um, fundamentally Aristotelian, immanentist um, uh, works of, of Kalam, uh, which certainly don't involve any uh, invocation of Akbarian concepts. Um, previously very well known, much less well known today, is that Jurjani was also a fully fledged Akbarian. Um, and he had a very interesting uh, concept of the subordination of uh, what are called the Akliyat, which are basically the immanentist um, uh, uh, Kalam sciences broadly following the Mashati or peripatetic uh, Aristotelian um, methodology to Akbarian metaphysics in a scheme of scientific subordination, subalternation uh, derived, uh, well, really given its most um, uh, developed uh, incarnation by, um, by Ibn Sina, of course. But his Tarifat, which is the first quote here, is the most famous, possibly the most famous book, uh, book of terminology of the sciences um, uh, in really the last 600 years. This is the way that he defines falsafa or philosophy. Assimilation to the divine to the extent of human capacity for the obtainment of endless bliss as the truth or one. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace be upon him, commanded when he said, take on the character traits of God, tahallaku bi akhlaqullah, that is, become assimilated to him in all encompassment of the objects of knowledge and detaching oneself from matters pertaining to the corporeal. And then, if you, of course, we have these very famous excerpts from Plato, which were treated um, in, the, in the Neoplatonic um, tradition as uh, uh, definitions of philosophy, of course. So um, I think the, the most striking one here is we should make all speed to take flight from this world to the other. And that means becoming like the divine so far as we can. And that again is to become righteous with the help of wisdom. So, one of the most striking similarities between the Akbarian system, if you can call it that, really the school of the Eastern school of, of Al Sheikh Al Akbar, or the greatest master, which is how uh, Ibn Arabi is often referred to, um, and Neoplatonism, um, begins with, of course, the uh, the, the very distinctive apophatic approach to understanding the absolute. Um, and I just want to draw attention here uh, to a particular uh, correspondence, which is 
very famously in that Aquarian tradition, um, it's not just merely said that God cannot be exhausted by any, or, or God's nature cannot be truly grasped by any finite determinate concept, but also that even our apophatic activity has to be negated of him. So um, it should not be understood that in the degree of non-determination, al-la-ta'ayyum, which is God in his ahadiyya, in his exclusive unity, where we can't really say anything uh, about him at all, um, other than that he exists, um, it should not be understood in the degree of non-determination he is not knowing, almighty or willing, nor characterized by the rest of the attributes. Rather, it is that there in that degree there is no name or description. That is, it is our considering the pure essence and the capacity of being beyond all attributes and names and unconditioned by any determinations or perspectives, even from the restriction unconditioned, hatta an qayd al-itlaq, and does not mean that he does not have these attributes and names in himself. It is what is meant by their statement, the necessary is absolute existence, al-wujud al-matlaq, that is pure existence unconditioned by determination by qualifications. And of course, this is a, a very famous excerpt from Dionysius's uh, mystical theology, um, which I won't read out in full, but um, I think the, the most striking thing for me here is it is beyond assertion and denial. We make assertions and, den and denials of what is next to it, but never of it, for it is both beyond every assertion, being the perfect and unique cause of all things, and, and by virtue of its preeminently simple and absolute nature, free of every limitation, beyond every limitation, it is also beyond every denial. Now, A very immediate objection and uh, doubt that often arises about these, these highly apophatic approaches to understanding God as beyond any possible predicate, beyond any possible description, um, is how it could possibly be the case that, that reality as we know it emerges from uh, this cloud of total unknowing, um, what can possibly make the link between determinate being and absolute being beyond any possible determination? How is it possible to understand the idea of creation emerging? And in the Islamic tradition, there is a very uh, famous hadith ascribed to the Prophet uh, Muhammad وسلم, um, generally agreed actually not to be an authentic hadith in terms of the usual understanding of chains of transmission, um, but uh, that nonetheless um, is, is seen as having been validated by the testimony of the Mokher Shafin, or those who have mystical unveiling, as being nonetheless authentic. So I was a hidden treasure, and I loved to be known. I thus created the creation, and through me they have known me. Let's see if I can actually read the Arabic script I put there. Al Mahabba Zatiya hiya ta'ayun al awal min haithu qabiliyatuhu li idhari dhalika ta'arif lil khalq. So this famous hadith about the, the that he loved to be known is often associated with a, an Akbarian term, Al Mahabba Zatiya, which becomes the cause of the of the creation is is the divine essential love the love of the divine essence which is it says here which is the first determination the Muhammadiyah, in terms of its capacity to to make manifest that making known of god to his creation of, of himself to his creation so in that sense, oh, uh, the Haqiqa Muhammadiyya, which will shortly come to, is identified with this Mahabba Zatiyya, with this uh, love of the divine essence. 
Let me see if I can move this thing because I can't see. The exemplar in accordance with which the entire world exists, though without particulariz particularization, that is particularization pertaining to one or another of the worlds of manifestation, is the knowledge subsistent in the self of the real most high, for he, glory be to him, knows us through his knowledge of himself and existentiated us in accordance with his knowledge of us. He existentiated the world, glory be to him, in order to reveal the dominion of the names, for power without the object of power, plenitude, plenitude without bestowal, a provider without the provided for, an aider without the aided, and a merciful one without those who receive mercy, would be realities devoid of active influence, the active influence that is a part of their nature, again from the Futahati Makia. And this uh, draws to uh, my very amateurish mind the um, Aeneads, of course, of, uh, of Plotinus, um, or Aflotin in, in Arabic, um, when he speaks about the one as dunamis ton pantone, as virtually all things in, in the Gerson translation. So that God, in knowing himself, knows the creation. It's in the act of, of that self-knowledge that God, God the, the, the creation uh, non-temporally, eternally, uh, is manifest to God. And of course, uh, a similar thing, uh, a commensurate principle certainly is to be found in, in Augustine. And so this mystery of, the, of the, that transition from absolute, uh, indeterminate uh, being which can't be grasped in any way to uh, an understanding of the emergence of multiplicity and created being. And we have these extraordinary uh, statements from the Gospel of John and, and from a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And I was a prophet when Adam was between water and clay. And there are many such other statements in the Hadith. Um, uh, now, today, often much disputed um, and of varying grades of authenticity, but um, the very interesting uh, statement from one of the great Sufi exegetes um, uh, of the uh, 17th century of the Ottoman Empire when he says Muhammad. the people out of the of the outward out the outward scholars and the people of inward witnessing or contemplative witnessing um, have are in agreement that God most high created uh, all things from the light of Muhammad. So there was clearly a very different degree of, of, of familiarity of, of this principle at that time. So we have Al Haqiqa Al Muhammadiyya. Uh, and now to introduce this very key understanding in Islamic metaphysics, especially of the Akbarian school we have this beautiful statement from the uh, famous Salat al fayyidiyah the litany of, of the emanation um, from Ibn Arabi, where he says, Allahumma salli ala awwal al-ta'ayyunat al-mufadati min al-amaa al-rabbani wa akhir al-tanazulat al-mudafati ila al-naw' al-insani. So one of the, of course, uh, very uh, basic and fundamental uh, uh, devotional practices in Islamic um, practice is uh, is the, the idea of the prayer on the Prophet, um, in which blessings and uh, ascent in the form of a prayer to God upon the Prophet. So it says, Allahumma salli ala awwal at O Allah, send blessings upon the first of the determinations, al mufadati al ammai rabbani which uh, 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 emanated from the lordly unknowing. The same subject talking about, and the last of the divine descents, the descents of the divine attributes, al insani, which then became affixed to the species of humankind. So this kind of sweep across the degrees of being. And then we have the concept in this possibly rather garish uh, illustration, which is min, min, 
من عينه تفرع تفرعت الأعيان في العلم from his essence the essence is in the divine knowledge the infinite essence in the in the divine knowledge branched out atemporally branched out and so this is this understanding that the Muhammadan reality is in a way the uh, wasita the intermediary between the one and the multiple and the, the the one and multiplicity but at the same time the Muhammadan reality uh, is not another person within the Godhead but is rather uh, himself or, or the Muhammadan reality uh, which uh, are not understood in this uh, understanding to be separate centers of consciousness um, but are rather ways in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in which God looks at himself um, uh, uh, so the Muhammadan reality itself is one of the ayana thabita or one of the of, of the immutable archetypes but that possesses an ontological rather than tempor uh, t tempor temporal priority. And this, the importance of the Muhammadan reality in the broader scheme of, of the Akbarian ontology, um, then becomes uh, revealed in terms of his relationship to the other degrees of being. Um, and so, based on difference of perspective, there are very many. Uh, different ways of referring to the, the same thing often in the Akbarian system. Um, but the Muhammadan reality as the principle of God's knowledge um, then descends into the different degrees of being just as the other objects of God's knowledge, the ayana thabit of the direct objects of God, God's knowledge, each of which are images of the divine names, aspects of the divine name, um, also have this tanazul or this descent into different individuation conditions, different degrees of reality. Um, and so the Muhammadan reality is, arises from the fadal aqdas of verti, the most holy emanation of the essence, by which the ayan or the essences in the divine knowledge uh, become distinct non-temporally. Um, so the Muhammadan reality is identified with that first determination. And the second determination, which takes place via the Muhammadan reality, the divine names which previously were in their unknowable, super-essential form in the divine unknowing, become distinct through the individuation or the entification, or might say the ta'ayun of the ayyan of Thabita. And this is what's also known as al-wahidiyya. And so we have, if you look at the right side, a kind of henological uh, understanding of this uh, uh, effusion within the divine essence um, in terms of principles of unity. So God in his absolute state of unconditioned being is exclusive unity, al-ahadiyya. In his state of gatheredness, in which the elements that have the uh, potential to become multiple, uh, and again, you know, language is, 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 uh, is powerless here, but uh, become unif unif uh, come under a principle of unity, uh, in which we can then refer to God as one God with his essence and his attributes and all these things which in the mind are multiple. We talk about al-wahda, determinate unity, which is the Muhammadan reality, uh, reality. And then when we get to the level of the immutable archetypes, where the divine names become manifest, we talk about unified multiplicity, um, where in the Muhammadan reality, what is in some sense general becomes uh, detailed and, and multiple but but is unified as all referring to a single god and this is also the second determination um, and these are the levels of divine reality so this is all taking place within god but the multiple aspects are in terms of of the artibar martibar the perspective of the, of the knowing subject looking at god um, and the relationship between the divine names and the objects of the divine names. But then if you look 
beyond where we have, you can't see where I'm pointing, um, or I can do it with the mouse, but we have al-fayd al-muqaddas al-sifati. Uh, it, it's at this point, the holy emanation of the attributes, that we have the first degrees of creation. And there's a very interesting understanding of the meaning of creation in the Akbarian tradition, which is that creation means the self-consciousness of the ayan, that, that previously in the divine knowledge don't have self-consciousness. The meaning of their creation is that they become self-conscious. And so you have first the luminous world of the spirits, alam al-arwah, where, uh, which is the dwelling place of, of angels uh, charged with particular functions in the, in the cosmic order, um, is the place, and this is the, the time to, 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 to introduce really the most fundamental aspect of the Akbarian understanding, which is the understanding of uh, mavahir and the way in which every subordinate degree of being constitutes a locus of manifestation under new individuation conditions of the previous degree of being. And so, whereas the Muhammadan reality has this priority amongst the ayanathabit or, or fixed essences or immutable archetypes, the first intellect in the world of spirits is the corresponding madhar or, or locus of manifestation of the Muhammadan reality, which then also possesses, uh, in turn, its own um, priority within the world of spirits. And the, the first intellect and its relation to al uh, <clears throat> al nafs al kulia which is the universal soul, which some of the Akbarian's author, authors say the universal soul has the relationship to the first intellect similar to the, the relationship between the second determination and the first determination. And that the, the first intellect, we have a general, uh, we, we, we don't have uh, the, the emergence of fully distinct um, mul uh, multiplicity, but rather it's a kind of, uh, uh, I suppose um, uh, the, the, the first intellect contains the power, uh, the, 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 the plenitude uh, of, of the, that makes possible the emergence of that form of multiplicity, but it doesn't take place at that level. And then understood also in the realm of spirits is the Holy Spirit, Gabriel, um, nature, which, which is very strikingly similar to the notion of nature in Plotinus. And then we have the cloud, also known as the phoenix and the hula, which is hula being, of course, hule or prime matter, but which has a specific um, designation connota uh, uh, connotation in the in the, the Akbarian uh, system. And then finally, the world of imaginal representations or alam al-mithal, or not finally, but but second to last is the world of imaginal representations, which is al Mithal, one of the most distinctive um, aspects of the uh, Akbarian understanding. Uh, in this world, al Mithal, spirits take on bodily forms, bodies take on spiritual form, and human conduct and deeds become individuated persons. Pure meanings become manifest in symbolic correspondences of image, images, and incorporeal essences are seen in the forms of physical bodies. The chosen one, Muhammad, blessing to peace be upon him, saw Gabriel in the form of Dehya in that world. And evidence for the existence of the world of imaginal representations is, it comes from many different sources. Um, one of them is the way that it, uh, it interprets certain facts of the prophetic mission um, and certain uh, things that, that scripture refers to. So one of them is that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, would see Gabriel sometimes in the form of a man. He would sometimes see him on the horizon with hundreds of wings. Um, and this is understood to be possible because of the existence of Alam and Methal. Um, some thinkers like Suhra Wardi would say that Alam and Methal, uh, 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 we have a window into Alam and Methal every time we look into a mirror. Um, but it, it, it constitutes a very, very interesting uh, understanding of that between the noetic world and the corporeal world there is an interspace which is not pure intellect nor is it pure corporeality um, and it also provides a very interesting and very fruitful theory of art in that uh, the understanding is that we all while we have what's called al-mithal al-muqayyad uh, 
which is the restricted or conditioned uh, uh, world of, of, of imagination. There's also the absolute world of imagination. The restricted world is the individual human being who, who imagines and sometimes, or, or, or who dreams, and sometimes contact is made with that self-existent world of imagination in which the same uh, pure essence or pure meaning, the same pure essence, which is single, will take multiple symbolic forms. Um, and so there's an understanding that in the act of writing fiction uh, or in the act of painting, there is an active uh, connection taking place um, in varying degrees of purity with uh, this this self-subsistent world of, of imagination and then understood to uh, be the, the final level of manifestation which itself is a madhar just of, as the world of imaginal representation is the madhar of the world of spirit and the world of spirits is the madhar of the immutable archetypes and all of the immutable archetypes are in some sense contained within the that immutable archetype which has absolute priority which is the Mohammedan reality so the earthly kingdom is a madhar of the world of imaginal representations and whereas a single meaning can become manifest in in multiple uh, bodily forms in the earthly kingdom we're stuck with just one bodily form so that's the understanding of, of that now why why uh, why is it that we have to posit Alam al-Mithal in this understanding? Alam al-Mithal is positive because it's understood that the world of pure spirits, which has no relationship whatsoever to body, can't really interact with the world of body. And so we have to posit a, an interspace, which is in some sense, to put it very crudely, half spirit and half body, uh, which, which can account for that interaction. And of course, there are many other reasons. So let's have a quick look at the time. Um, and so, with our, um, the, with, 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 with in, the, in the context of, of, of what we're speaking about today, um, and in terms of the, the, the Hapiqa Muhammadiyah, which to be associated with Islam, I mean, certainly in the way that someone like G.K. Chesterton or others would view Islam as this kind of austere and barren, deserty type of religion it's certainly not very congruent with what we've just seen but on the other hand uh, as abdul hakim murad and and uh, and and uh, michelle chodkiewicz and, and others have, have noted the the akbarian metaphysics is the dominant metaphysics of of post ibn arabi um in the islamic world so there's also a degree to which our contemporary situation uh does represent a very specifically modern um, uh, state of affairs very often related to uh, the emergence of Salafism or often known as Wahhabism um, and so on and very very complex factors and it's not as simple as that of course but uh, Abdul Karim al-Jili himself a, a great expositor of the, of the Akbarian school although a somewhat atypical member of the Akbarian school um, tells us al-Nasara the Christians are closer than other religions to the Muhammadans or those who follow Muhammad because whoever witnesses God in the human being his witnessing akmalu min kana shuhuduhu uh, his witnessing will be more perfect than all those who witness God in the other species of creation. Now, of course, those familiar with this very interesting uh, comparative religious section of Philin Sanal Kamal, or the perfect man by, by 15th century Abdul Karim al Jili will know that um, this isn't at all a, a statement of perennialism um, because he goes on to say that uh, on the other hand um, the difficulty uh, lies with identifying exclusively a particular uh, 
determinate being with God to the exclusion of other beings. And of course, the understanding also that uh, God's manifestation limitlessly transcends the sites of manifestation. So while God theophanically becomes manifest in the sites of manifestation, in himself, he limitlessly, limitlessly transcends any determinate site of manifestation. However, the, 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 this is not cited in order to some facile idea of a shared metaphysics, which would not be remotely acceptable to Orthodox Christians or Muslims. But what's very interesting is that the, the Akbarian uh, point of view allows for a very respectful metaphysical appreciation of how it is that, let's say, uh, Orthodox Christianity came to its particular point of view. And there's a, there's a shared intelligibility in understanding that it may be that because of a difference in fundamental principles, we've come to a different conclusion what's possible. Um, it's not simply this angry rejection of, of the Trinity as, as a straightforward polytheism, um, which uh, is often associated with Islam today. Um, and we see this further in Sheikh Abdul Ghani in Nabulsi, a, a very uh, eminent 17th century Akbarian in, in Damascus, um, who uh, in his Keshf al Ghain an al Farq bin al Basmil al uh, this is quoted in, in Alusi's uh, Alusi's uh, Ruh al Maani, a, a, a 30 volume exegesis of the Quran. He's also an Akbarian, but it's an, both an exoteric and esoteric uh, exegesis of the Quran. Um, uh, and he was the 19th century, early 19th century uh, Chief Justice of Baghdad, interestingly enough. But he says, um, so Sheikh Abdul Ghani Nabulsi. Quddis Asidru, may his secret be sanctified, says that Basmalat and Nasara, the, uh, the Basmala means, I mean, the, the, the words which begin every Quranic verse are Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Then we have the Basmala of the Nasara, which is, the, I believe, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, and uh, this is what he's referring to here. So instead of saying, well, this is an outrageous, uh, you know, um, allusion to three gods, um, as might might be expected amongst Wahhabis today, um, he says, "Basmalat al Nasara mushiratun ila thalath ila thalathi hadarat lil amr al ilahi al wahd al ahad." So it refers to three presences of the divine being who is one and has an exclusive unity. Al ghayb al mutlaq. So God in himself is the pure and the pure unknown. Whereas Fal'ab, whereas the father, Isharatun ila ruh is an allusion to the spirit, Aladhi huwa awwal makhluq lillahi ta'ala, who is the first created being created by God, kama fil khabar, as is passed down to us in tradition, huwal musamma bil aqal, he is known as the intellect, wal qalam, and the pen, wal haqiq al muhammadiyah and the Muhammadan reality. Wa yudhafu ila Allahi ta'ala fi yuqal ruh Allah. And he can be ascribed to God so that we say the spirit of God, lil tashrif wa ta'zim, in order to honor and reverence this reality. Wal ibn isharatun ila Isa. And the son is a reference to Jesus, alayhi salam. Wa huwa ibnun li dhalika ruh. And he is the son of that. Uh, spirit because his uh, coming into existence is, is because of the breathing in, in of existence uh, of the prayer hadra or, or divine presence well abhu al ibn and the father is the same as the son well ibn huwa ruh al qudus fil haqiqa and the son is the same as the holy spirit in reality well ghayb al mutlaq munazzahun muqaddasun an hadhihi al thalatha and the absolute unseen is far transcendent beyond these three. For innahu subhanahu min haythu huwa, for he, glorified be he, in himself, la shay'a ma'ahu, there's nothing with him. Wala yam yumkinu an yakuna ma'ahu shay'a, and nothing can be with him. For basmalatul injil, so the basmala, or the bismillah, in the name of God, of the gospel, min maqam as sifat is referring to the uh, divine names 
and the Lord, the divine attributes, lordly names. Not in terms of the station of the holy essence. So, of course, um, this is not, uh, of course, remotely uh, brought up in order to uh, be some sort of way of rapprochement between the, the Akbarian understanding of Christianity, because all this is utterly unacceptable to Orthodox Christianity. But on the other hand, I think it's very interesting that this is taken seriously as a metaphysical, as, it, as, as something arising from metaphysical principle, which I think uh, makes the, the Akbarian perspective can, can, can make a much more fruitful uh, engagement between Muslims and Christians, which is highly respectful um, and which understands in some sense where the other is coming from, even if we disagree, um, that, uh, that I think is, is, is of, of huge benefit. Um, and rather than, you know, interfaith uh, simply involving kind of polite tea mornings where we try to uh, avoid uh, talking about theology as much as possible, um, the idea that some sort of engagement on this level is possible, I think, is, is extremely interesting. Um, and so uh, I think something which strikes me very, very strongly um, in terms of, of, of what might be possible um, as this project develops. Um, uh, last year when I came to Cambridge and, and encountered, thanks to Douglas Headley, for the first time, um, extraordinarily for the first time really Plotinus um, and also uh, uh, in the course of doing my dissertation work uh, uh, Dionysius and I was amazingly struck by how many extraordinary correspondences there are between the Akbarian system and the Neoplatonist Neo tradition which, which arises which really counts um, Plotinus as its greatest father. Um, and something that struck me most of all is the idea that um, the deduction of hierarchy, the understanding of hierarchical degrees of being, why is it very significant, I think, in this time that uh, the imminentist philosophies, which in some sense dominated, or at least interpretations of great thinkers, the, the, the neo-Thomist interpretation of Aquinas, which of course is not uh, widely accepted today, um, that he's fundamentally a pure Aristotelian. Um, uh, and also the, 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 the situation with Avicenna, Ibn Sina, whose influence in the Islamic world is, is, uh, uh, is unparalleled, um, who broadly uh, has a similar understanding um, in the sense that the sensible world is independently intelligible. Um, it's a hylomorphic fusion of form and matter, um, existence is only possible if there's individuation, so we can't have uninstantiated essences as in the broadly Neoplatonic understanding. Um, and I think that, uh, and I'm sure that, uh, well, for one thing, we now know that Aquinas uh, wasn't really a pure Aristotelian. Um, and on the other hand, um, much more eminent, much more intelligent uh, Thomists, um, uh, and many of them um, than myself, uh, would probably have a very ready answer. And, I'm, uh, and, 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 and I think that's part of the reason for uh, commencing this type of dialogue. But I think that the idea that as Muslims and Christians, we can mutually recognize a hierarchy of being, a moral hierarchy, an aesthetic hierarchy, and a metaphysical hierarchy, which, yes, on certain levels does differ, which is fundamentally mutually intelligible, um, just seems to me far, far easier um, when we're not talking about immanentism in the sense of the idea that, uh, that existence um, is dependent upon individuation. Um, and, um, and so these correspondences, uh, we have, of course, the very famous statement in the very first proposition which really captured my imagination. Um, Pan plethos meteche pe to henos. Every manifold in some way participates unity. 
Um, and then we have, of course, the very well-known reliance in many ways of Dionysius upon Proclus, and we find in the divine names, multiplicity cannot exist without some participation in the one. That which is many in its parts is one in its entirety. That which is many in its accidental quality is one in its subject. That which is many in its number or capability is one in species. That which is numerous in species is one in genus. That which is numerous in its processions is one in its source. And of course, the deduction of hierarchy in the Neoplatonic system is fundamentally based on this and, and certain other very important principles. But I think this is really the starting point, which is the idea that any manifold requires a participation in unity in, in order to become intelligible. And that principle of unity has to actually exist. It can't just be a consequence of the individuation because that would be seen to be a type of vicious circle. Where, uh, so the, the, the prayer principle must actually exist before the individuated being that comes under and that uh, principle of unity is rendered intelligible, that principle of unity uh, is able to come into being. Th th those are the, in, in, the, the, existent, in the conditions of the possibility of its existence. And so we find a very similar thing in Sadruddin al Qurnawi's very famous exegesis of Surat al Fatiha. Uh, Sadruddin al Qurnawi, of course, the spiritual successor, direct spiritual successor of Ibn Arabi. And he says, Kullu suratin wujudiyatin yata'alaku bihal idraku ala ikhtilafi maratibihi. So every uh, exist, well, every form in existence that possesses existence. Um, cognition pertains to it in its different degrees I think I might have transcribed this wrong but so essentially what, what he's saying is that uh, the distinctness uh, and, and may he forgive me if I'm wrong but the distinctness of a of uh, of of uh, the forms that our cognition can pertain to um, uh, are only rendered possible that they consist in the conjunction of intelligible realities which are in themselves incorporeal and it can th this reality can only appear as a single thing um, as a con consequence of its following on from al-hukum uh, uh, al the unitive, uh, uh, the, the sphere of in influence of the principle of unity, which is ultimately rooted in al-jam al-ilahi, uh, which, which is, was, is identified with, with the, the haqiqa Muhammadiyah as an ultimate principle of unity. And I appreciate, uh, I'm probably, um, well, I'm certainly losing myself, I think, really, before anyone else. But, uh, um, but to go back to this theme of, of, of immanentism and, and, and transcendent exemplarism, um, we find in another great Akbarian of the 16th, 16th century writing against the, the immanentism of, of Ibn Sina. He talks about those who have restricted being to that lowest of its degrees, which they call extramental existence of Wujud al They thus say that if aquidity is not individuated, it does not exist, making existence into subsidiary of individuation. The truth of the matter is that the degree of being is prior to all other of the degrees. That is the degrees of genera and species to say nothing of the degree of individual particulars. That the sciential forms are the essence of things and the forms of extramental particulars are shadows thereof, subordinate thereto, is the terminator of all difficulties and the guide against all misguidance, not as the philosophers have reversed matters, saying that the extramental particular forms constitute the fundamental principles and the intellectual forms representations and shadows. The upholders of this latter position become so entangled in difficulties that every time they try to extract themselves from one, they fall into another. And again, in terms of the, uh, the pertinence to the idea that Muslims and Christians both participating in a single reality of which is intrinsically intelligible um, can in some sense arrive at the same 
uh, or, or a comment, certainly a commensurate uh, cognition of the degrees of being um, uh, uh, is something that, uh, uh, and, and, the, and that this can allow for a treatment of some of the very fun, most fundamental problems of uh, modern philosophy, um, uh, which, which in some sense is, is genuinely shared, um, I think is facilitated again by our mutual recognition of the idea that uh, in this henological ascent to, to actually existent principles of unity, um, uh, we're recognizing fundamentally the same thing. And one of the great uh, Neoplatonist um, scholars of Neoplatonism of recent times, who sadly passed away in actually in February of this year, Jens Halfwassen, uh, has this extraordinary statement, um, which I found in an article of his and, and really um, uh, hugely struck me, which is that he says, that which is presupposed by each intellective act from its very beginning cannot, cannot itself be the product of an intellective act which presupposes it. An intellective act originally posit, positing unity would not be unitary before this position and would therefore be nothing and thus not be a thought either. The one presupposed by every intellective act as a condition for taking place does therefore not rest upon the subjective positioning of thought itself, but rather necessarily precludes all subjective unifying actions of thought. And I think many people rightly will be thinking of Kant here, who of course recognizes that reality can only be intelligible in that the manifold is subsumed under a principle of unity, which of course the uh, transcendent unity of apperception, but of course, he believes that this is a unity which is only imposed by the mind. And I think, again, there's an extraordinary way that we can see that through the, hierarch the idea of hierarchical order and principles of unity, well, I certainly think we can take care of that difficulty very, very easily. Whereas if you look at some of the ways that in Kalam, for example, uh, someone like Sheikh Mustafa Sabri, who has a beautiful book from you know, very... Uh, firmly from the Kalam tradition, but which tries to critique modern philosophy, and he has great, great difficulty with people like uh, Kant. Um, and, and I think this is exactly because he can't deal with Kant's fundamental problem, which is how intelligible the, the framework that renders intelli uh, reality intelligible uh, can possibly be objective since uh, it can't be abstracted from the individual particular, and he, he thinks it must therefore be imp imposed. Whereas from the perspective of Neoplatonism or the broad uh, idea of hierarchical order, uh, no, there can be a prior realm of uh, intelligible reality um, uh, that actually exists prior to empirical particulars, and that empirical particulars become intelligible by participating in. And so in a way, they're transcending the transcendentals, um, which in the Islamic tradition, they're more amma, um, those uh, in principles which uh, um, uh, follow on from being necessarily. But if they only have an imminent reality, again, uh, accounting for their objectivity becomes very difficult. Um, and uh, as I almost always manage to do, um, I haven't reached the end, so I'm going to have to skip this um, this final one. But uh, I'll, in my admittedly very disjointed presentation, um, I'll end with this less technical on this less technical note, which I think is very very beautiful, and um, and this shows again how much uh, while Ibn Arabi, uh, there's certainly an amazing correspondence. Um, and commensurability with the Neoplatonic tradition also relies very, very much on, uh, or, or, or most fundamentally, of course, uh, relies upon the, uh, the data of revelation uh, for his understanding of reality. And so in this very, very famous quote from Al-Futahat al-Makir, which I'll, I'll close with, it is he who appears in every face, is besought in every sign, beheld by every eye, worshipped in every object of worship, Quested after in the unseen and the visible. Not one of his creatures can fail to find him in its intrinsic disposition and primordial nature. <laughs>
for the entirety of the world is at prayer to him, frustrating to him and glorifying him with praise. So uh, thank you very, very much for, uh, for your patience in bearing with me while I go through these slides and, um, and uh, I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Over to you, man. Uh, thank you so much, um, Sayyid Hassan, for that deep dive into the metaphysics of the Akbarian and drawing that, those lines and connections to, uh, to the Christian tradition. Thank you, uh, everybody, for allowing me to share my enthusiasm for one of the best uh, and by his uh, own intention, least known masters of Christian theology that mysterious figure whom Pope Benedict proclaimed in a 2000 general audience, a great mediator in the modern dialogue between Christianity and the mystical theologies of Asia. The mediatory potential of which his Emeritus Holiness was particularly thinking is the Pseudo-Areopagite's well-known apophatic proclivities. This aspect of Dionysian thought has until recently dominated scholarly interest in him, to the extent that most who have heard his name at all will associate it most readily with his treatise on the divine names. Now following that papal exhortation, I wanted to enlist Dionysius into service for my doctoral work as a fitting interlocutor with Shinran Shonin, founder of the Japanese True Pure Land School of Buddhism. Yet I found that Dionysius's apophaticism, his famed Via Negativa, was not the only or even the primary grounds for theological engagement with Shin Buddhism. It was not in philosophical generalities, but in their concrete and specific manifestation, in liturgically or more broadly cultic outworkings, that I found areas of metaphysical overlap and concord. In this emphasis on specificity, I'm doing nothing new, I'm merely following the methodological imperatives of the likes of Henri de Lubac and Francis Xavier Clooney, who insist that to compare anything as general as Christianity, Buddhism or Islam to core will not lead us very far, given the breadth of intra, let alone inter-traditional uh, variegation. So rather, I chose to compare two specific textual traditions, that of Dionysius and that of Shindan Shonin, and attempt to become as far as possible bilingual in them, though ever conscious of my own theological sympathies and commitments. Now I hope to bring the same Dionysius into conversation with Ibn Arabi and his successors, bringing Dionysius into comparison with an Islamic theological tradition of shared platonic stock. Right. But this time there is a considerable difference, which I consider a boon. For while I have enough Japanese to read Shinran and Greek to read Dionysius, I have no Arabic, and so I come to Islam quite blind. My first thoughts were, were that I would need a teacher, someone steeped in the living tradition of Islam. But soon after Professor Headley introduced me to Hassan Spiker, I realised that I'd found in him far more than that, a colleague a learned lover of God, steeped in a living tradition of platonically infused Islamic theology. And so began the idea for metaphysics across borders. Now, we're in our early days, so I will not make much reference today to Islamic theology. I'll find out which one it is. It's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. I have two lively children who may just pop out screaming any minute, so... <laughs> we're going. It, I, I, anyway, to revert. Uh, we're, we're in our early days, so I won't be making much reference today to Islamic theology because, frankly, I'm not yet confident enough in the sources after only uh, a, a few months, really, or a couple of months of study. Nor will I focus on the transmission of Dionysius via Syriac recension to the Islamic world. What I will do instead um, is set out what I think it is makes Dionysius unique beyond the plain fact of the, the shared apophatic platonic influences. Uh, and I will finish by articulating briefly why I think such an endeavor matters beyond the academic 
in the pejorative sense of the word. I'm aware that there are people here, uh, like for example, Professor Stang, uh, who know far more of Dionysius than I do, and there'll be people here who have studied him very little. So forgive me if I teach anyone to suck eggs or worse, to mislead anyone and correct me by all means, please. So there's nothing especially unique about Dionysius prioritizing privative predications of the divine and insisting on God's ultimate unknowability and concomitant transcendence of being. In this, he is arguably making few advancements on the principles of Parmenides or Plotinus or Proclus. We need to pay attention to his specifically monotheistic and even more specifically Christian interpretations and developments of these principles, otherwise there's not much point. Given the limits of time, I will try to give an account of the fundamental metaphysics which he shares with the Neoplatonists, uh, controversial though that be, interwoven with just three features of further expo exposition, namely his pseudonymity, theurgy, and hymning. Now Dionysius in himself is not uncontroversial. I am commending for your attention a pseudonymous Platonist who deceived the world about his identity for centuries, who compares the divine names with magically animated pagan idols, and who at one point describes God's creative activity as that of a drunkard waking up with a hangover, all illustrations which I will bring into play today. You might think it a fool's quest, but if St Paul is to be believed, folly is God's wisdom. And besides, enough very serious ink has been spent or very serious keyboards eroded on taking Dionysius uh, very seriously indeed, as we should. Yet in doing so, we risk missing part, I think, of the Areopagite's point. He does indeed write seriously much of the time. Yet I think with his confected identity, with his references to fictional forebears in the faith, and weighty sounding tomes it seems neither he nor anybody else ever actually wrote, with his ambiguous use in the service of Christian doctrine, not only of respectably philosophical pagan terms, but of those particular to pagan cult, and with his not quite allegorical defence of the most perverse depictions of God in scripture, there is a sense that Dionysius is playing with us. So, wary of the soporific potential for online lectures, I want us today to join his game, a game of hide and seek, of hiddenness and revelation. Theologians are quite good at masking their inner playfulness, however joyfully the font may gurgle behind the grave garden wall. Yet play has its pedigree in both the pagan and Christian streams in which Dionysius was immersed. Whoever he was, as Luther and Calvin both dismissed him, it is clear that he was not the first century Athenian philosopher converted to the Christian faith by St Paul, as reported in chapter 19 of the Acts of the Apostles, the Bible's principal account of the life of the early church, despite his strenuous attempts to maintain that illusion, including letters written to the Apostles Timothy and St John the Evangelist. Yet we can say with some certainty now that he was formed by the philosophical school of Athens, thanks to definitive and objective links between his work and that of Plotinus, and above all, as we have heard, Proclus. The life of Proclus and the first literary references to Dionysius in the 520s allow us to locate him as a Christian Platonist of the late 5th to early 6th century. To say any more would demand conjecture, of which there is plenty, but enough for now to establish him as a Platonist, and so an heir to that playful sage, Socrates. Now Plato Socrates is of course a player in the primary sense, an actor in the dramatic dialogue form, and the part he plays in Plato is that of disruptor, challenger, self-professed gadfly and ignoramus, professor of unknowing. He is the consummate anti-professional, despiser of polished pretense, scourge of the sophist, router of the rhetorical relativism which gilds the ambitions of Attic youth, and yet at the same time a master of the very arsenal he professes to despise. Take for example when he casually corrects the speech of the orator Lysias 
which the boy Phaedrus presents to him for approval in the dialogue of the boy's name. He criticises the form and yet hones every syllogism, syllogism to the most persuasive degree in support of an argument he despises, that one should bestow sexual favours not for love but for material gain. But then, as though possessed by the muse, he begins to spout dithyrams and hexameters, Socrates who supposedly holds poets in even lower regard than orators. And at this point he breaks off, and Phaedrus sees that Socrates has been playing with him the whole time. The philosopher is about to leave it there, cross the river and head back to town, but this is when his tutelary deity, his guiding spirit, steps in to stop him, as it does, he says from time to time, when he has erred. But his error was not to play. It was blasphemy to abuse the name of love for ambitious, self-serving ends, to detach beauty from its proper place in the ordering of reality towards the good. But Socrates, in the end, is nothing if not a conscientious educator. He cannot leave Phaedrus thinking that mere formal excellence in rhetoric, the skill of a Thrasymachus or a Callicles, would edify the soul of the student. It is time now for Socrates to say what he really means, time to get serious. Yet, Socrates is at his most serious only when he is most playful. When he wants to entreat in greatest earnest, he leaves aside the polished prose of the professional public speaker and speaks instead in myth. In this case, the well-known myth of the charity, charioteer and the soul. But you could take the myth of the creation in the Timaeus, which we've heard of already tonight, the myth of air, the myth of the cave, the myth of the origins of love in the symposium, or many others besides. Is this then an abrogation of his famed irony, a final resignation from his customary contrarian Elenchus? No, Plato's play with myth is a deepening of that ironic principle. When Socrates engages in critical dialogue, that is one form of his disruptive play, there he undermines the well-built walls of doxa, the bulwark, bulwarks of entrenched opinion, that form of knowing which sits on the lower half of the Republic's epistemological line. But when he brings myth into play, what he calls his probable explanations, this Greek bears his gift right into the inner citadel of episteme itself from which he means to disrupt even our higher reasoning and so lead to where reason itself must segue into folly. Only so may knowledge give way to wisdom. Plato has been accused of obscurantism and totalitarianism on these grounds. He uses myth, it is said, to shut down conversation and silence opposition. Well, there are good reasons to uh, accuse Plato of political totalitarianism, but let's leave that aside for today, because I'd rather answer the charge of uh, obfuscation. First, we must overcome our fear of the dark. We are so used to describing Plato and his followers as rationalists that we often forget two things. First, that reason for them means something different from what it means to those whose minds have been formed under post-Enlightenment European assumptions. And second, that for them, knowledge based in reason, even a priori reason, for all its participation in the good, is not the highest pursuit of philosophy, for that is higher still. And this, I think, is why Dionysius and his forefathers play the games they play. The first rule of the game was set by Parmenides. Being is identified with knowing. The second is the Neoplatonic dictum that any source is simpler than that which flows from it and participates in it, and in order to differ from its participants must have an imparticipable quality to it. The ultimate source of being must therefore be essentially beyond being and so beyond knowing because of the identity of those two, two wonderful and excellent 
for us to attain. And this is the one and the good. One, because beyond multiplicity, good, because the generative source of all things and their profoundest desire. As the origin of being and knowing, the one can be compared to the sun, as Plato does famously in the Republic, followed by Plotinus, Proclus, Dionysius, and many I understand in the Islamic world, not least the Illuminationists. For the sun gives both light to the eyes for understanding and warmth to the world for nourishment and growth, knowing and being. A fairly uncontroversial depiction, one might think, of the God whom Christian scripture calls the Father of Lights, whose divine word called himself the Light of the World, and who, St John proclaims, dwelt among us to enlighten all people. Yet the same John will remind us that no man may see God and yet live. And so Dionysius begins his mystical theology with a prayer to the triune God, not just as light, but as a dazzling darkness, the source of spiritual light, which must therefore be beyond light and beyond darkness, beyond being and knowledge, beyond discrimination. To quote the psalmist, the darkness is no darkness with thee, but the night is as clear as the day. The darkness and light to thee are both alike. And I understand that there are parallels to this sentiment in Ibn Arabi. Dionysius follows this prayer by building on motifs of such as St. Gregory of Nyssa, of Moses ascending the mount into the cloud, which hides the inconceivable presence and yet illumines his own face. We must know nothing. We must, in a sense, unknow and unsee as we pray to enter the darkness of that immeasurable light that we may be illumined and so see. Dionysius brings scripture into play as Plato brings myth, these stories to shake the rational edifices that we have built and reveal the foundations of true wisdom which lie beneath and beyond. This relationship of knowing and unknowing, being and non-being, revelation and obscurity sets the scene for the game of hide and seek that I think Dionysius is inviting us to play in the Divine Names and beyond. Unexpectedly, the playground we find is littered with statues. A 1982 article by the great Platonist Henri Dominique Safre cites a very unusual phrase at the beginning of the ninth chapter, which treats of the similarity and dissimilarity of all names to God. Dionysius lists various opposing characteristics of God, including similarity and dissimilarity themselves, as this, theonumica agalmata. Now the word agalmata is glossed in translations as images, because the literal rendition seems so perverse at first sight. It really means statues. But since Dionysius uses other, more common Greek words for image elsewhere, this unusual usage should alert us, particularly given its coupling with that rare word, theonumica. Taken together, Safre sees no alternative than to translate the phrase as the divine names which are statues. You can see why translators have avoided literalism here. Yet to do so perhaps is to count to 22 slowly and give Dionysius too much of a head start. His odd phrase exposes a connection to a now forgotten commonplace of 5th century Athenian Platonism, the theurgic animation of idols. Calling divine names statues came into vogue in the Athenian school, specifically in Proclus's time, which identifies Dionysius all the more closely with that specific intellectual milieu, just when the pagan statues were being removed by, from their temples by imperial Christian decree. So how does a Christian Platonist come to identify the divine names with the disgraced idols of a not very distant pagan yesteryear? <laughs> 
for two reasons, I think, one of which Safre expounds at some length and the other at which he hints. The first is historical and a reference to an older Platonic tradition yet. In the Symposium, Alcibiades compliments Socrates by comparing him to Silenus, the drunk and grizzled old tutor of the pagan god Bacchus Dionysus, whose statues adorned wealthy Athenians' homes. Now, why buy a statue of an ugly old man, you may ask, and how could this possibly be a compliment to Socrates? Well, the statues were made deliberately ugly, but hidden inside them, behind a door, was another statue, typically of the goddess Aphrodite, who is, of course, goddess of beauty. So, behind Socrates' uh, reputedly snub-nosed exterior, Proclus comments uh, that Alcibiades is admiring the interior statues of his virtues. That is, hidden within even the basest of images resides the image of divine beauty. The second aspect of this apparently idolatrous association is its controversial connection with theurgy. Literally meaning divine work, uh, theurgy has long faced censure. Moderns as great as Dodds have deemed its late arrival in the Platonic system a foreign blight to the pure Hellenic gene pool of Platonic and Aristotelian philosophy, which engendered a sort of folk religious hick cousin of unsavoury ritual magic and ultimately failed popular Platonism meant to rival the mysteries offered by the now predominant Christian cultus. Some ancient Platonists agree with that sentiment, including Porphyry and even Plotinus himself, mostly, though more could be said about that, especially if you look at the life of Plotinus chapter 10. But anyway, regardless, Christians too have dismissed uh, theurgy. Recall, for example, the vitriol of such a great Platonist as St. Augustine in his City of God. And many Dionysian scholars more recently have persisted in understanding theurgy as a magical attempt to manipulate the divine will, as though to, to control God. Yet the founding father of theurgy, the Amblicus, and a chief influence on Proclus, protests the contrary. Theurgy, he objects to Porphyry in his Divine Mysteries, is the gods using the theurgist, and the gods using the material ritual objects, or synthermata, as vehicle of the divine will, bringing out the divine essences concealed in material things, which correspond to their spiritual reality. Theurgy is not an attempt to control divinity, though he says there are such evil magics. Rather, it is an offering of submission to the divine will. Now, Iamblichus is a priest of Egyptian mysteries who sees Platonism as a philosophical lingua franca for pagan practice throughout the world. And there is no sign in his work that he sees Greek thought as alien to his world. And it is, after all, a commonplace among Platonists that their tradition derives from Italian, Pythagorean, Indian, Egyptian, and possibly even Jewish influences an understanding which, among others, Augustine and, I believe, Surawadi share. The Amplicus does not see himself as importing a foreign system to make sense of his religious practice. And the reason I say this is that nor, I think, does Dionysius. What Dionysius takes from theurgy is no degenerate folk religion, but a sophisticated appraisal of Platonism, taken from Iamblichus and developed by Proclus. At the practical level, Dionysius applies theurgic reasoning to the Christian use of material outward signs for the conveyance of inward spiritual grace in the sacraments. Material bread duly consecrated reveals the bread which nourishes to eternal life, for instance. But that is not all. Theurgical theory has wider implications for the Platonic understanding of the relationship between the divine and the cosmos, which will help us to describe a clearer glimpse of our reclusive quarry. <laughs>
A typical summary of Neoplatonic metaphysics might run something like this. The one or good produces intellect, which in turn produces soul, and the soul's contemplation of the forms in the intellect yield being, in its own variously stratified conjunctions, raising from the spiritual at the top of the scale to the inanimate at the bottom. Yet there's a danger here of regarding this as a linear emanation, and imagining that as a result, all that exists does so at several removes from God in dualism and opposition to the divine source. Thence come the anti-Platonic accusations about the denigration of matter at the expense of spirit, hatred of the body, and so on. Plotinus's doctrine that an element of every soul must remain clinging on in the realm of spirit may not help the matter, and his enneads vary on the question of the value of matter depending on his polemical, uh, polemical intents at the time. Yet for Iamblichus, Proclus and Dionysius this is not so. For them matter always matters. On this I think Proposition 57 of Proclus's Elements of Theology is instructive. He says that the higher the source or cause with certain caveats, the wider the range of its participants or effects with the same caveats. This is a logical inference of Neoplatonic doctrine of the inherence of effects in their causes, but it receives little explicit development beyond this proposition of Proclus. What it shows is that the various hypostases and productive sources are not separate from one another like dots on a line, rather they are encompassed within one another, more like Russian dolls or ripples in a pond, if you will. The one, as it were, contains or enfolds all things, and so is immediately present to all things, regardless of how many or how few of its subsequent hypostases each thing may participate in. God is as immediately present to a stone as he is to me, even though the stone participates only in being, and I participate in being and life and sensation and, in my own limited way, intellect. Now this leaves us with an irony not unbecoming of Socrates himself. For while we, as rational and intellectual beings, are closer to God in that we participate in more of the substrates of being which unfold from him. Inanimate things, by their relative lack of participation, are paradoxically closer to the God in the sense of simplicity. Theurgy is the ritual outworking of this insight, and despite Plotinus's apparent hostility to it, it builds on his doctrine of contemplation expounded in Ennead 3.8 on the contemplation and production of things. For all things contemplate the one by virtue of their participation in him, even the stones contemplate after their fashion. Indeed, they are theophanies of his contemplation. The hierarchy of being then is not one of distance, rather it guarantees proximity better even intimacy and inherence. Dionysius goes further still, he extends this principle even to what he calls non-being, which may sound odd, but he seems by this to be referring to matter qua matter, non-existent because without form. Like Christ descending into hell, the divine source beyond being embraces even the negation of being, for whither shall I go from thy presence, as the psalmist continues. In riposte to those who despise all hierarchy for such grievous and oppressive injustices as the fact that a stone cannot fly, Dionysian hierarchy is a truly hiera arche, a holy order, because it is not an order of power, but of contemplation and of love, the divine love for each thing according to its capacity, which makes differentiated and diverse existence possible in the first place. Yet 
you strike the stone and a fountain of light pours forth. In all their diversity, all things are theophanies in their way, illuminations of one undivided light. Like those idols of Silenus, all things hide divine revelation. Even matter is, in the most literal sense, significant of God, an agalma theonumicon. So, a couple of caveats. Caveat one, this does not make Dionysius a pantheist, because to return to our point from Parmenides, God is in his essence beyond intelligibility and being, as we've heard elsewhere tonight already. He is not within the hierarchy of being. He is not even there as some kind of supreme being, like the corporate executive of a celestial pyramid structure. Hence Dionysius's at first strange association of divine names with those old Silenus statues. Any name of God is in its way like one of those. It is necessarily a false representation in one sense because God cannot essentially be known. And yet, nonetheless, the hidden God reveals himself in every name, even the most unlike likenesses. What's more, these names are real, they are true, they are God-given. They are not our own nominalistic designations, any more than theurgy is a manipulation of the divine. To know their truth, we must deny them, but to deny them, we must first know them. The second caveat then, Dionysius, I hope I've made fairly clear, is not an idolater. The only statue he would have us worship is the statue which is not there. And this motif too brings us closer to finding him in his game of hide and seek. Let's take his origin story, as it were, in Acts 19. Paul ventures into the Agora of Athens. He looks around at the statues of the gods in, on their plinths, and his gaze finally settles on one that he actually finds to his liking. It's an empty plinth dedicated to the unknown god. What you worship unknowing, he declares, I proclaim to you. And on that word, unknowing, hinges together the pseudonymity and the theology of the Areopagite. For it is not the adverb, unknowingly. Paul is not accusing the philosophers in the market square of ignorance. In fact, I think they receive him rather more warmly than many translations make out, with hidden comparisons to Socrates that I can't go into here. But no, unknowing, agnoontes, is a participle a verbal adjective indicating process, and this is the sense in which Dionysius takes it. That which you worship by the act of unknowing, this I proclaim to you. And this, I imagine him inferring, is why the historical Dionysius with whom he identifies himself turned and followed Paul, by pointing at that empty plinth, that invisible statue, Paul was promoting the apophatic way as Dionysius sees it, revealing the very hiddenness of God, even as he proclaimed his manifestation visibly in Christ. Dionysius goes further with the statue motif, which you can also find in Plotinus, and which I was intrigued to hear of referred to in discussion on uh, Ibn Arabi as well, uh, calling those who seek wisdom to chisel down even the statues of God that we worship in our minds, every image, until their hidden silent core is revealed. Only from such silence, the still small voice, the wordless groanings, can we dare to utter the divine names. All our efforts to articulate, to syllogize, to sculpt and to rationalize God will only ever fall far short however necessary they may be. And so for Dionysius, in the end, there is only one proper way of addressing God, and that is by what he calls hymning. Not a new word, for we find it in Plato and Proclus, but novel in its application. This hymning, humnein in the Greek, I see as an extension of Socrates' mythopoeic wordplay. The right use of speech towards God is not that which describes him, but which 
orients us towards him. And while the ranks of spiritual and intelligent beings are better equipped for this task in their sense, every being takes, takes its part. All the world is a cosmic choir of voices like that in Psalm 19, through which God breathes his own names. And of course there is discord, but in a way this is a happy fault, and it's a fault in the chords rather than the breath, for even those flaws lend a certain richness to the harmony. Perhaps we might say the cross is the happiest fault of all in this from a Christian perspective and the greatest discord. Dionysius is sometimes chastised for not speaking enough about the cross, and it is true that he does not much directly. For this, the reasons can only be conjectured, but not here and not now. It will fall to his much later successor, St Bonaventure, to crown Dionysian theolog theology explicitly with that more Franciscan emphasis on the cross. And I suspect that Bonaventure too will bear comparison with Ibn Arabi. And yet I think, nonetheless, we can still find the cross hidden, as we might expect now, in Dionysian doctrine, namely in his teaching on kenosis, self-emptying of God. This is a doctrine to which he at one point gives rather visceral expression in the final unlike likeness that I wish to bring up today. Standing outside his senses, ecstasis frenon, inebriated, God has projected everything that is good while staying over full of all of them, an excess of all infinitude, and yet again dwelling outside and transcendently above all things. That's from Dionysius's ninth letter. Now, Dionysius is not always as serious as he's made out to be, but I think his play here with this image of a this very or in, un, you know, in a, unlike likeness of a, of a drunken god is in earnest, because the image of God as drunken giant isn't something he's made up. It's taken from the 78th Psalm. And so for Dionysius, it constitutes a revelation of sacred scripture and therefore must be, uh, must be, must be spoken of. And he insists that the least appropriate images like this that we find of God in the Bible are in fact the best. Why? Because the less appropriate the image, the lower the risk of idolatry. We are in no danger of actually thinking that God is a giant who gets drunk. Yet here, Dionysius, is, Dionysius pushes the metaphor further. He finds in the inebriation of God an insight into the creativity of the divine nature. The relationship between divine goodness and the divine will has vexed Platonists, Christians and Muslims alike, and incidentally proves a barrier to Buddhist comprehension of theistic belief. Plotinus treats of the matter systematically in Enead 6.8, but here Dionysius, as you can see, is approaching it rather more playfully. The problem basically is whether God as good in nature is therefore necessarily generative of being, or whether God creates by sheer will. Monotheists have been keen to preserve the freedom of God's creative act, but of course this comes, as we know, at the potential cost of making the divine will seem arbitrary. Plotinus' solution is that since there can be no external law beyond the one to compel it, the one's goodness is its own law, and so the divine will essentially is the divine nature. Now Dionysius takes this in his image, but I think somewhat nuances it. God, he says, is out of his senses, or more literally in ecstasy, ecstasy from his senses, as though his head were reeling. Creation is God projecting all the good things inside him, and yet they somehow remain within him, while at the same time he is ecstatically outside and beyond them all. Strip away this metaphor and we're left with the fairly standard platonic conviction that the divine creative will is straightforwardly one with the goodness of the divine nature. God's will and God's nature cannot be dissected. Yet there's a new layer of meaning here. 
The divine inebriation, as it were, is somewhere between sheer will and emotional excess. God, Dionysius elsewhere says, is drawn out of himself as though bewitched with love for his creatures. Like the crucifixes, Japan's hidden Christians carved onto the back of Buddhist statues in times of persecution, I think this is where we find hidden Dionysius's theology of the cross behind this image. For what Proclus calls ecstasy, Dionysius baptizes with the Pauline biblical word of kenosis. The self-emptying of God proclaimed in the Christological hymn of Philippians 2, 5 to 11, wherein Christ divests himself of divine glory and equality with God to take the form of a servant. Because all things inhere in the one, God is simultaneously standing outside himself in creation, and yet at the same time completely unmoved and contained. And this picture is one of a certain suddenness, an improvisatory spontaneity, a playfulness which is redolent not only of Plato, but also of that Ennead of Plotinus 3.8. This tract Plotinus explicitly frames as a kind of play, and in it he relates how things spontaneously generate by their contemplation. Although the one can formally speaking know nothing, for intellection would imply process and hence multiplicity, as the flowing font from which all things overflow and proceed, they are enfolded within the one. And so in a fashion beyond our comprehension, we can say that God knows all things intuitively and simply by contemplation of himself. Given the identity of knowing and being, you could say that God contemplatively knows all beings into existence. And building actually on what Hassan said earlier, this knowing and loving uh, and being uh, all segue into one. There is a certain dreamlikeness to this notion of creation by contemplation, an appeal to the will as imagination, so vital to Platonic theories of true knowledge as recollection which again tends towards an inner playfulness of the mind, a playfulness of the soul. Let me draw things to an end. Dionysius is still hiding in the shadows, I know, peering out coyly from behind the backs of Paul or Plato or Socrates. Yet I hope I've managed to expose something of him and not to obscure him even further. His theology of naming, is that of hymning, addressing God in a way which disrupts our idolatrous logic and opens our lips that they may show forth his praise. His theurgy, like Moses' stave, erupts the divine significance of the cosmic order. His pseudonymity is how he lives out his theology of divine hiddenness, hiding himself following the example set by his spiritual master Paul, who would no longer live, that Christ might live in him. But whenever he disrupts those orders, from beneath them erupts the greater order, which is fundamental and real. Now, I somewhat provocatively base the title of this talk on that of Rod Dreher's Benedict Option. Uh, forgive me for the bandwagoning. He calls in this popular book for Christians to uh, huddle against the storms of nominalism and relativism which are howling in from the West and to guard the faith much like monks of old. And I must confess a certain amount of weary sympathy with this view, but I don't think it's enough. Dionysian ecstasy is not the flight of the alone to the alone, whatever some of his critics might say, but he is ecclesiastical and celestial communal and cosmic in its scope. His philosophy shows us an older path which is as key to Western theology as the path of Saint Benedict. It once offered Latin Christians a very different way of navigating reality from that of modernity and importantly, as I, I think Dr Laham really, really showed, this does not isolate us from the rest of the world. Rather it is secular assumptions of vaunted neutrality which divide western philosophy from the traditional philosophies of the rest of the world and us from each other 
filing us away as religions, privatizing our wisdom, relegating it to the realm of unprovable and so forgettable opinion. Divided and conquered, we Christians and Muslims face the same erosion of our continuity with God, the cosmos, and one another. But if Christians are to become part of the solution to the problems that secularism throws up, we must begin to work more closely with others, it seems to me, even as we clean our own stable. The sacramental metaphysics of Dionysian Platonism offers a language which can help Christians make allies of others who equally strongly desire and seek the truth, and gives us an, a mutually intelligible language, at least, to those of us who want to stand against the nihilism of our age and who wish to see the cosmos re-enchanted, a task, in my view, as vital for Christians as for Muslims. Our interfaith work, it has been said tonight already, does rather run the risk of polite compromise in the interest of pragmatic cooperation, and pragmatic cooperation is nothing to be scoffed at. But Ibn Arabi and Bonaventure, that great Dionysian, show that those who are outwardly clad in Suf need not be intellectually woolly. The Areopagite option, as I see it, is to follow holy fools like Socrates in their iconoclastic dance, but only and always in order to expose the enduring and eternal order which emerges from the cracks beneath their feet, the darkening rays which blind us into unknowing and plunge us into the contemplation of the love-drunk one that we may see and know and love with pellucid sobriety. I'd like to, to thank the organizers of the conference for um, asking me to, to speak at this point. Um, and I'd like to begin uh, just by picking up on a thought um, that we heard um, from Karim Laham uh, about the romantic legacy, because I think in terms of these uh, intellectual uh, culture wars, I think uh, there's an interesting tension, certainly from the uh, European Western perspective of a dominant enlightenment tradition, which is shaping most of the discourse. But there's also a, a romantic alternative, which you know, re-emerges from time to time. And autobiographically, uh, I can say that I, discovered the, the Neoplatonic tradition through that romantic inheritance. It was particularly through, through Coleridge. And I suppose it's this sense of Platonism as a living tradition that uh, was motivating me in setting up the Cambridge Center for the study of uh, Platonism. And I think this is why it's an appropriate venue for the project of uh, Father Tom Plant and Hassan Spiker because it's a center for thinking about the Platonic inheritance in the broadest sense, uh, both in the Christian and in the Muslim traditions, uh, and of course in, in the Jewish tradition as well. Uh, Whitehead, Nietzsche and Heidegger all viewed Western thought as being generally rooted in the legacy of the Athenian. And in many ways, uh, postmodern thought, uh, with its roots in Foucault and Derrida, is a, and, and uh, of course, uh, uh, is a radical repudiation of Platonism. So um, it's in this sense of, of Platonism, as it were, as a kind of Mississippi River of, of, of Western thought, uh, that we have had a, a a wide array of talks at the center from figures like Tolstoy, Hermann Hesse, Tolkien, early Irish literature, uh, Leibniz. Um, uh, we've had seminars on Jakob Burma, uh, notions of the spiritual body, uh, the idea of subjectivity. So we've really had a, a, a broad range of, of themes here. Um, now, when Dr. Karim Laham spoke earlier of a link between metaphysics and 
prophecy uh, and raised this very important issue of the link between revelation and metaphysics. Um, it was in that context he mentioned the idea of God as beyond the distinction of being and non-being. And here we had a reference to uh, the notion of the, the Gottheit and God or the Godhead and God, uh, which Hassan mentioned uh, more recently. And indeed the notion of the, the Ungrund in, in, in um, Burma, in Jakob Burma. So some notion of a primordial unity that is actually prior to the uh, self-explication of the uh, Christian Godhead as, as Trinitarian. So this living tradition um, is one in which uh, Eckhart and Burma are certainly uh, important. Um, and I, I certainly hope that people wouldn't think of, of what we're doing as being uh, narrow. Now, if you forgive me for a bit of uh, uh, advertising for the centre, I want to point out that, that we are a hub for grants and we've been exceptionally successful in winning grants uh, from the AHRC, from the British Academy, from the ERC, from Shirk in Canada, from uh, Marie Curie, on topics such as the Cambridge Platonists, the reception of Marsilio Ficino, uh, or theories of nature. And we have links that are, are genuinely international from the UK to continental Europe, uh, Canada, Japan, and the US. But it is a center for scholarly work. So we have at least one seminar each week on a major text uh, in the Platonic tradition. And this term, we have been reading Proclus's uh, elements of, of theology. We also have regular seminars and workshops on specific topics and texts. And we invite eminent speakers to offer lectures uh, at the center. Well, why this particular project uh, in the Cambridge Centre for the Study of Platonism. Well, part of the significance for, of the Platonic tradition lies in the subterranean nature of its influence. In the Christian world, Origen, Dionysius the Areopagite, of course, Augustine and Boethius drank deeply from Platonic sources. And then medieval Christian thinkers drew upon a Platonism that had already been baptized. So it wasn't present to them as alien, as pagan, or indeed as necessarily in contrast to scripture. And of course, in the Muslim world, the translation of Plotinus as the theology of Aristotle and the attribution of the thought of Proclus to Aristotle through the Liber de Causis meant that Neoplatonism was a part of Muslim theology thanks, of course, to the prestige of the Stagorite in the Islamic world. So it was often precisely because Platonism was not recognized as such, um, neither in the Muslim nor in the Muslim or in the Christian world, that its influence was often so potent. Now this is, I, think I, I don't want to develop this idea uh, particularly at the moment, but I just want to flag that up, that in a sense, um, the, the, there's an interesting parallel here in the Christian and Muslim worlds that these platonic sources were often having um, a particularly powerful uh, influence um, because of issues about attribution. Now, in Father Tom Plant and Hassan Spiker, I think we have an excellent team with the philological, philosophical, and theological skills requisite for the task. Um, as was argued, I think, earlier today, that it's really important for serious comparative work that those engaging in it have a real understanding and engagement with the history of their own tradition, as well as the passion and the energy to carry it through successfully. Um, so the center is devoted to the cultivation of intellectual investigation and 
contemplation uh, rather than uh, the ideology and propaganda that so often passes for intellectual life in much of the contemporary uh, academy. And Father Plant and Hassan Spiker are engaged in serious debate, not an exercise in cross-cultural blandishments and public relations. Now, I want to highlight a point which is common to both Father Plant and, and Hassan Spiker. And that I think is that we shouldn't confuse reason with rationality in the narrow instrumental sense that has become so widespread since the European Enlightenment. But this is more than saying that there is a distinction between wisdom and a scientific rationality. It relies, I think, upon the philosophical revival of a distinction between what the Greeks called nous, intuitive reason, and dianoia, discursive reason. And, and I think this distinction is central to the aims of the center because the religious imagination must be guided by both nous and dianoia if it isn't to collapse into fantasy and wish fulfillment. Both the skilla of relativism and skepticism of the postmodern ideologues and the charybdis of a narrow scientific materialism and utilitarianism must be confronted with intellectual tools. And this requires a reimagining of a shared metaphysical inheritance in the modern world to uphold the spiritual truths that bind both Christians and Muslims. In this context, the relevance and urgency of the product, project of Father Plant and Hassan Spiker should be clear. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Hidley, for your closing remarks and um, also about the information about the center and the activity of the center, which is very important, I think, for uh, attendees. Also, I want to thank Father Tom Plant, um, Hassan Spiker, and uh, Dr. Karim Laham for their um, uh, talks today. And also, I would like to thank everybody for making that happen and for attending and for your time. Uh, I know it's not easy to have such a long event, especially virtually on Zoom, but that's great to, to have people there now. So thank you so much and um, hope to, to meet soon in another uh, event. Thank you so much. Have a lovely evening. Bye-bye.